Tonight, Wavy Davy puts on his anorak and looks into the future. Has the internet's utopian moment already passed? Interactive images from Japanese artist Toshio Iwai. In our weekly hot list, American author Kevin Kelly shows us to his favorite sites on the World Wide Web. And choosing an alternative identity in cyberspace, Benjamin Woolley checks out the weird and wonderful worlds of multi user dungeons. The information infrastructure of multi-channel television. All human life is here. I'm reading these messages. Wherever you're hooked up to. Sorry? It means nothing to anybody. The trouble with all this media attention and the coverage of the internet is that it's attracted an awful lot of new people onto the net who would never have come along before. We can be part of a brave new world. We can access online information, online entertainment. We can have email. This is a community where people have got total freedom of expression. They can say what they want, do what they want, but they're responsible. They don't need somebody legislating for them. They don't need the government to tell them what to do. Hey man, let everybody play in the playground. Hmm, so uh, what have we got here then? There's the Anoraki nerd, the evangelical businessman, and the West Coast cyber guru. Three well-worn stereotypes of the sort of people who inhabit the internet, as imagined by those who don't, yet. But don't dismiss them. What they have to say does reflect the current state of the internet. There's no question that there's going to be an online revolution, what with millions of people getting connected. The question is, how bloody is it going to get? Galloping commercialization, issues surrounding censorship, and the inevitable culture clash between net newbies and old hands are all raising their ugly head on the internet. Along with online jockeys, cyber celebrities like me, who've escaped from their virtual communities to find fame in the real world. Now this is Jonathan Miller, head honcho at Delphi, News International's online service, and the man who brought Sky TV to the UK. Whether you like it or not, big business is here, and big business is going to be the force that develops the internet from being a minor uh, byway on the world communication stage into being possibly the globally dominant form of communicating in the future. The increasing number of information providers will lead to increased competition. And basically, competition is a healthy thing for technological advancement and investment into current infrastructures. So, Anne, what are you actually doing with Microsoft Network? The Microsoft Network is a complete online service in its own right, but it has a gateway onto the Internet. And also, you can get from the Internet onto the Microsoft Network, so it's a two-way two relationship. The Microsoft Network is a, is a managed environment uh, with third-party information providers and various basic and extended level services. But if you want to get onto the Internet via this gateway, you can do so and then browse around or surf the Internet. Commercial services tend, obviously, to charge for the information they provide. But isn't there a danger that eventually we'll end up paying for every piece of information online? I don't see a downside to the commercialization of the internet because I don't think it's going to stop anything else happening. I already pay to get on the internet. I have an account with a service provider. I pay them 10 quid a month and I'm paying for what I use. I am, if you like, part of the commercial internet. What about Rupert Murdoch's boys at News International? Well, I can't really be specific. It wouldn't be quite right for me to sketch out our plans in detail. But our challenge is to project our media brands and our content onto the web. Oh, goody. Doesn't anybody think that Microsoft, News International, somebody will try and dominate the online world? I think they'll try. Um, I don't think they'll necessarily succeed. Uh, the online services are probably the hardest market for any one person to attempt to corner because, in a way, it's self-publishing, publishing be damned. You've got your own area where you can go and you can put your own views forward. Um, it's not a conventional publishing medium. But a growth in commercialization will increase demands for censorship of the net, won't it? After all, corporates are conservative by nature. I think already you're seeing some of the commercial providers um, 
providing their own limits as to what they're prepared to provide, um, be it as a, as a commercial or a moral or any other kind of decision, they are already restricting access to some of the news groups that they feel they don't want. Um, and that's, that's their decision to make. The news groups will still be available via another route. The internet interprets censorship as damage and routes around it. Mm -hmm. You can usually find things by going through some other route. So it seems very likely that a that Delphi, run by News International, will probably have the moral and editorial standards of News International's newspapers. You can make of that what you will. I don't know if they're commercial press pressures. I think they're partly commercial, but I think they're mostly moral and ethical pressures. I, my background is a journalist, and I'm the, ed the editor of this service. And I'm aware of what the law is in this country on such matters as obscenity. And therefore, where I find obscenity, uh, I will not provide it over my service. We make that decision um, entirely upon uh, legal advice. All we seek is to reduce our liability. We will not censor the internet. But whatever service providers might claim, governments are trying to censor the internet already. In the United States, Senator Exxon and his Communications Decency Act will prohibit online communication that's obscene, lewd or lascivious, not to mention filthy and indecent. The bill is very poorly written and is really a threat to free speech for adults on the networks. What's worse is it doesn't make any distinctions between consensual materials and non-consensual materials, or between private materials and public materials. Therefore, for example, if I wanted to send a steamy love note to my husband in private electronic mail, it would be criminal under Senator Exxon's bill. I think one of the reasons why perhaps uh, the governments want to exercise some degree of control is because the internet really does affect their power to make people think the way that they want them to think. And one of the powers of the internet is that people can get information and views and news from a whole range of different sources that, that governments and the media themselves just can't control. And he's a policeman as well as chairman of community, the Computer Communicators Association. But the issues get even more complex when you start to think about the networks being international in scope. Is it going to be that Singapore is going to start going after United States citizens or British citizens for materials that are perfectly fine in their countries but that are not fine in Singapore? Don't know. So these threats to freedom of speech, coupled with growing commercialization, are really upsetting many old hands on the internet. Companies have been accused of, of turning the internet into a cesspool of greed. One user emailed me to say that he saw it going through a period of growth where it was populated by prats. Well, that's pathetic. I mean, I mean, it's very interesting how people who were great innovators 20 years ago when this network was being born are coming and looking at horror at the fact that ordinary people, taxpayers who actually paid to build this thing, uh, might actually have a chance to use it. It's a fundamentally anti-democratic and narrow-minded approach. So is the internet the new utopia? Can it ever be? No, the internet is not a utopia and never will be. It will never be a utopia nor a dystopia. It will be what we make of it and what we want from it. It's merely a medium and we'll use it in order to paint our future. Media attention. Citizens ban television. That's a tiny machine. Parental control. Pornography. Emerging technology. Basic civil liberties. A brave new world. A cosy environment. It's merely a medium merely a medium. Toshio Iwai is an artist in the digital age. His work includes software design and programming, interactive television, and gallery installations. 
Time Stratum II employs stroboscopic lighting at varying speeds to bring to life hundreds of cardboard figures on a turntable. All of his work exploits the latest moving image technologies, but an important source of inspiration comes from the moving images of more than a century ago. While at university, he discovered the magical inventions of the cinema's prehistory, including children's flipbooks. I found uh, a lot of uh, fantastic invention of the prehistory of cinema in a book. And I realized uh, that flip book, when I was uh, uh, making uh, in a primary school, it was, uh, a, uh, it was also a kind of invention in prehistory of cinema. And I started to recreate a flip book with computers. And this was uh, one of flip book I created in university and I used the XY plotter uh, uh, to generate a computer-generated image on, pa on a paper. Then I started to create this Zotrop, and this Zotrop is also one of the uh, most important inventions in prehistory of cinema. And uh, normally, um, for this Zotrop, people put a uh, uh, strip paper strip with drawings to see the moving image on a paper. But uh, instead of uh, drawing, I put a, a three-dimensional clay model in this door drop. And you can see the uh, three dimension, a kind of three-dimensional animation with this door drop. I can show you. Another 19th century discovery revived by Toshio Iwai is the phenakistoscope. You look through the slits on a spinning disc and see the reflection of an image on the back of that disc. The slits act like the shutter of a projector to create an astonishing illusion of movement. These are step motion, I call them. Um, I'm using a kind of special motor, which is called stepper motor. If I use a, a normal motor, um, maybe the image looks uh, not like this, and looks just a turning. Um, but uh, using a stepper motor, um, this stepper motor uh, turns very quickly, but uh, uh, it almost stops, and, it, at, and it, it turns uh, quickly and stop and turn and stop, then you can see the uh, moving image on the paper. In 1992, Toshio Iwai started work on a children's show for Japanese television. Real kids were combined with computer-generated backgrounds and characters. <laughs> For live programs in the series, he created an interactive version of sumo wrestling. Children sent in wrestlers drawn on postcards, and these were scanned into the computer. Bouts involved shouting down a phone line, with the noise level converted into muscle. This is a music insect. Uh, it's a kind of uh, visual music software. You can see the four little creatures walking on the screen. I call them music insect. You can draw anything on the screen using this mouse. If one insect across the dots which you draw, he makes sound. 
And different color means a different key. And if you draw something randomly, they play random music. If the insect uh, meets white color, they goes to uh, the in, they goes in the opposite direction. And this red one is drama. And you can make a, a simple drum pattern very easily. Now, this light gray makes the insect turning light. Using this technique, you can make a loop. With this music insect, uh, anybody can compose their own uh, uh, music uh, with, your, with their drawing. Hi, I'm Kevin Kelly. I'm the editor of Wired, and I've just written a book called Out of Control. The idea in the book is that machines and biology will soon converge until they become one thing, so that we see machines as living beings and we see living beings as machines. A lot of the impetus for seeing very complex machines as living beings has come from the internet. My optimistic vision is that the future is actually a friendly place and that we have a fair amount of our own uh, power to create it. Yeah, I think someday in the future everybody will have their own homepage. Um, I'll show you the kind of places that um, I like to hang out. Here's a home page uh, made by a friend who has spent the last two months working on his home page. And he scanned in some of his artwork. And as, as you can see, um, each of these little blue areas is linking to another page. Um, he has some of his diagrams about his ideas about human consciousness. Um, he has all his columns that he's written. He has parts of his book up here. And he puts them up on the web, and anybody who wants to can come and see them. This is what the future is about. Content becomes advertising. He puts this stuff up. Yes, it's an advert, but that's what most of the content is. It's all going to be free. Content is going to be free in this new environment. The idea of Hotwired is that it's a cyber station. It's um, divided up into a bunch of different things. We have Planet Wired, which is uh, uh, an area where you can see what's going on in different cities that week around the world. You can click on uh, a city and you get the kind of the you know, alternative weekly view of the world. Here's another example. This one is um, I came across because um, it's a page by Brian Eno. It was not put up by him, but by some fans of his. Um, there's all that you want to know about this artist. A bibliography, a chronology, imagery, a discography, all the liner notes. We see in the internet a very 
a complicated yet functioning entity. And it works in a very biological way in the sense that it routes around its own failures in the sense that it has self-healing. Um, it grows in a very organic way. So all these things tell us that in many ways that the internet is, is sort of lifelike. It is, uh, nobody would claim that it's really living, but it has some of the attributes of a living system. It must be one of the most sociable, lively, challenging activities you can do on your own in a darkened room. It's a sort of dial-up computer game, a digital equivalent of the telephone chat line. You log on with your computer, usually over the internet, and find yourself in a fantasy world. A world where you can meet people, chat, fight, make love, live and die. They call it a multi-user dungeon, or MUD. For those that play it, this is much more than a game. It's a whole new way of life. So there it is, it's on the screen. There are no pictures, no sounds. You don't need a virtual reality headset or a holographic display. All you need is a 3D, true color, high resolution imagination. Because this virtual world only exists as text, like a novel. But in a mud, you can decide who you are and where you want to go. A mud world is also like a novel full of characters, but they aren't fictional. What they say or do is determined by real people who, like me, sit at a computer, experiencing the same world, but from their own point of view. They can also invent a new identity for themselves, a sort of virtual mask. In real life, they may be a student at Sunderland or a banker from Bangkok, but here they are whoever or whatever they want to be. I, for example, decided to be the listener. How did this know you lost? The Italian gardens over there. I'm going there. Do you want to come? OK, then. Because the characters are real, mud life has all the complexities and some of the dangers of real life. There are the same battles of the sexes, the same conflicts of interests, the same struggles to make friends. This world has the perils as well as the pleasures that you experience in real life, or IRL as mud players call it. Hello listener, where are you from IRL? Hello, gorgeous. Hello, legs. Lovely blonde hair. Oh, it's even better in my armpits. Oh, that's disgusting. I was only joking, stupid. How dare you? What's up? I didn't ask to be groped. I'm bored of this, I'm off. Thanks very much. Yeah, well, if you've been a bit nicer, I might have hung around. You don't make up a multi-user dungeon world as you go along. The descriptions of the locations are stored on a central computer called a server, and they continue to exist there even when you log off. But it's the users who bring the world alive. It's their interests and quirks, their creative and sometimes destructive instincts that give the mud its character. Death in this sort of world is not just a case of having to go back and start again. The Reverend Pudding really is no more, and when the person who adopted the good Reverend's persona returns to play another day, he or she will be reborn as someone else, a stranger, a newcomer who must once again go through the process of getting to know people, making friends, acquiring powers. Despite their playfulness, multi-user dungeons have a serious purpose. They're models for a whole new type of institution, a virtual space in which students can be taught, companies can do business, worshippers can worship. Some are even trying to use them to create experimental communities, literally to build new worlds from scratch in which they can try out different codes of behaviour, systems of government and new environments.
This isn't just self-indulgent escapism. Muds are not a playpen for adolescent nerds too disfigured by acne to show their faces IRL in real life. The aim is to create a space that will draw people in, enable them to discover new things about themselves and others. You don't come here to get a life, you come here to find out more about life. This in part is what interested mud pioneers like Richard Bartle. Muds are places where you can live. They're places of habitation. They're not games. They're not just things that you just crank up on your computer. They're places where you live. There are places you can go there to, to visit friends. You can go there to visit enemies. Uh, yes, you can die there. Muds mirror real life. They reflect every aspect of people's lives, the way they live, the way they talk with each other, and the way they socialize. People go there to, to talk and interact with each other, so things that are important to people in real life uh, get talked about and are important to people on MUDS. As with any society, there are good people and there are bad people. People go in there to have a good time, to uh, enjoy themselves, to meet other people. And there are people who will go in there to try and mess it up for other people. It's like a shared dream. You're all together in one place. There can be from hundreds, tens, or thousands of rooms uh, with thousands of people on them. MUDs have a life of their own. Without the users, there would be no MUDs. So the users define how the MUD works, how it interacts, and how it progresses. The result of all this can be a world that is, to say the least, bewildering. It can also be a bit frightening, especially for so-called newbies, newcomers who find themselves suddenly immersed in an alien world, populated by strange creatures speaking in unfamiliar tongues. But then, that could be a description of what it's like IRL. Information about internet access providers and details of a BBC educational video about the internet, send a large stamped addressed envelope to The Net, PO Box 7, London W5, 2GQ. In the next Net, two weeks from tonight, a familiar face at the virtual cinema, making the most of digital money, and sci fi author Jeff Noon on VR, Vert, and the mean streets of Manchester. And finally, from The Net, Charles Babbage is the great ancestral figure in the history of computing. Um, his designs for vast mechanical calculating engines of the last century are the forerunners of the modern computer. This is Babbage's grave, and um, there is no commemoration, for instance, to his great achievement. Further than that, um, this grave is actually not on the tour of prominent people.